Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to City Sewers. Today, we're gonna actually do our more detailed garden tour. I came in here uh, yesterday and did some cleaning up in here so that we can kind of see a little better what's going on and uh, kind of let you guys know what's actually growing in this crazy jungle. <laughs> okay, so first thing we have when we come into the gate is that I have my herb bed here. This is thyme in the top front corner here. And then this is a uh, blue spice basil. It smells very much like Tulsi, so I'm thinking it's pretty much a Tulsi. Uh, here is a cardinal basil that has not come into bloom yet. And this one is a spicy saber basil that does have a little bit of a kick to it. And we've got some chives. And unfortunately, I hacked back my um, oregano this year because it was really going crazy. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna hard prune it. If it dies, I'm planning on putting it somewhere else because it just takes over this whole bed. So I'm probably gonna put it or put a new one in that barrel when the season is over. But in the bed next to it, this is my pesto bed mostly. So this is the um, African Nunum basil that's new from Baker Creek this year. It's huge and beautiful and glorious. It's actually about time for me to make some pesto from it and see how that is. But next to it, I have my regular, this is an Italian pesto basil. And that is actually the name of the variety. It makes an amazing pesto. And then kind of tucked in here because um, only three of the four African Nunum plants took off. This is my lime basil, which totally does smell and taste like lime. It's amazing. In the opposite bed here, I have yet more basils. This is kind of the year of the basil for me. Um, this is your regular uh, sweet basil, the Genovese. Next to it, this is a lemon basil. And then next to that, this is a lettuce leaf basil. But behind those, we have tomatoes. Now let's see if I can remember all the varieties that I've got going this year. This one here is the Thorburns terracotta. And it's got some beautiful tomatoes coming in. The second plant in here, this is a blush tiger and it's covered. Oh, and it's actually got some ripe fruit there at the bottom. Let's see. Are you ready? Ooh, yeah, you popped right off. What about you? Mm, maybe tomorrow. All right, let's pop over here and eat the tomato. All right. Mm. Oh my gosh, it's really good. Blush tiger. Very tasty. Betsy, would you like the tomato top? Here you go. You're not picky. All right, moving on. This is an Oopsie Daisy Calendula. In the tomato section, moving on, I have, let's see, this is an orange peach tomato. Now this is unique in that the tomatoes are fuzzy, like a peach. Maybe not quite as fuzzy as an actual peach, but they do have a little bit of fuzz on them, which is very unique. And then in the middle here, I have a tomato plant that is very behind the others. It's a gold medal. I'm not sure how well it's going to do for me, but hey, some, trying is better than not trying. Next to the gold medal I have, this is an orange icicle, which is a kind of like a Roma type paste tomato that's orange. And unfortunately it looks like I've got one cluster here that has some blossom end rot, although the stem is snapped. So I'm wondering if maybe that's contributing to it because the rest of the fruit on the plant looks fine. But that's fine, I'll feed it some bone meal and it'll be fine. In front of these tomatoes, I actually have, these are violet sparkle peppers and get a load of this. This plant is only this tall, but it's got a pepper on it that's like the size of the whole plant. <laughs> Very impressive. But kind of this whole front here is all violet sparkles. Now. The reason that they are so small is because the goats actually ate a couple of them. And these are what has come back and regenerated. Okay, now opposite these tomatoes, I have this hot mess. I did not expect these volunteer sunflowers to do this. So what happened was I originally had a handful of sunflowers that I planted in 
I've got this really skinny little like six inch bed in here that originally was a gap between the beds and I was like, um, I don't use that for a walkway. So I just capped it and filled it with soil and threw sunflowers in it. And they were glorious. And they were single stock. So when these volunteered, I was like, oh, you know, that's fine. I'll just get a few single stocks. They won't like overwhelm the bed and it'll be fine. That's not true. Apparently cross pollinating a couple of single stock sunflowers would get you a majorly branching one. So I've got way more sunflowers than anticipated. They're glorious. Don't get me wrong. But they are hogging up all the sun and I have tomatoes in here that want the sun. So my plan at this point is to let these blooms live out their best life. And when the petals drop, I'm not going to leave the plants in. I'm just going to have to pull them out. Because I have a long enough season that I'm not going to rush to pull them out for the sake of the tomatoes. I'm just going to let them do their thing. And then pull them out and give my tomatoes some sunlight. Okay, now for the tomatoes that are actually in this uh, sunflower mess. I can't remember what this end one is, so I will uh, put the name on the screen when I go in and look it up after this tour. But the middle one here is a Napa Chardonnay Blush, which is like my favorite cherry tomato variety ever. And it does have some fruit on it. You just have to dig for it. See, there's some. And there's some. So. It's producing, it's just not doing as well, but the flavor on those are amazing. So when I get these sunflowers cleared out that are hogging up all the sun, those will really take off. And the last one that's being swallowed up by this giant sunflower is a nature's riddle tomato. This is the biggest tomato that I've ever grown. Actually, a couple years ago, we grew one that was two and a half pounds. It was a big tomato and it was delicious. Okay, so back on this side over here where the uh, orange icicle tomatoes are, uh, I've got some, these are some red onions. Those are red of Florence onions. So they're kind of more of a torpedo shaped onion and they're kind of ready for use. But um, because they've gone to flower, I'm not going to store them. I just, I'm going to uh, use them as needed because once an onion goes to flower, they really don't store as well. So it is what it is. But next to that, this is actually four cucumber plants all kind of crammed together. Now I had a plan that has not worked out as well because it they took a while to get going and then I was gone for two weeks and they decided to explode while I was gone. So my plan was to kind of get them to go up this trellis here, this half fence that I have in front and thread it that way and let it go and climb on the fence over here. But they have come out this way and it's fine. It's fine. It'll work. Uh, but this is actually two varieties. I have China Jade cucumbers mixed in with Muncher cucumbers. The China Jade is more of a slicer while the Muncher is a dual purpose. Uh, cucumber so it can be pickled or sliced um let's see oh see there's there's plenty of baby fruits coming in on it and we've already harvested some there's some in the in the fridge right now but yeah the cucumbers it'll be it'll be a good year now behind the cucumbers this is very exciting i have melons now i started with like seven or eight and just a few have petered out and it is what it is but the ones that are here oh my gosh they are making fruits and fruit and fruit and fruit like oh this is amazing so this is like my fourth year trying to grow melons vertically on this back fence and year after year i've only gotten like one or two melons and i think largely it was because the soil was just depleted and this year we're being really vigilant about monitoring the soil and uh, feeding the garden on a regular basis. 
so now I've got tons of baby fruit. I'm so excited. Now this mess over here is larger than I anticipated. These are eggplants. Um, I have grown them in another location before and they didn't get anywhere near this uh, huge. So I'm gonna have to come in here and stake these and tie them back because they're moving into the walkway. Yeah, they just need a little bit more monitoring than I anticipated, but they are producing. I've got three different kinds of eggplants. I came in here yesterday and picked several actually. These are e deer and purple striped eggplants. Let's see, I don't know if I have any, like this one is about to make a fruit, but you can't see it yet. They, oh wait, there's one. So those are purple striped. I really like that variety. And then I've got two new varieties that I have never grown before. I have the Rosa Bianca, which I don't, I have not witnessed any fruit yet on those. But the other one here, it's got a long complicated name, so I'm not gonna be able to remember it off the top of my head. I'll write it on the screen. But this is a new variety of eggplant that is orange and has a very unique flavor, so I have read. So I'm really excited to try it. See, there's one. It's not quite done coloring up yet. It's almost there. I am not so patient waiting on that. But I do need to trim this up because under it, that's a variegated basil that's hiding. So we'll have to stake these up, tie them up out of the way so that this little guy can get some sun that's just so pretty and then kind of in the middle of all that I also had these Kilimanjaro white marigolds they're lovely they actually smell really good compared to other marigolds which kind of have like this musky smell they they still have that musky smell but it's a little bit more floral it's more pleasant then next to the jungle I have this is the um, early straight neck squash and this is a plant this is actually two or three plants, but this plant back here has been producing conjoined twins, which is really interesting. I harvested one the other day and we ate it and it was amazing uh, on camera, but I don't know why that particular one is producing a lot of conjoined twins. The other plant seems to be producing them normal. So I don't know. I don't know if it's a genetic thing, if it's a soil thing, I don't know. So back in the middle bed here with the sunflowers, the other side has squash. This one here is a Cocozelle zucchini that has not produced anything yet because it was limping along until recently. Now it's starting to really take off. So I'm expecting to get fruit off of that soon. The other one here is a cube of butter hybrid and it it certainly makes a lot of them. It has failed a lot of them. I think mostly because it's producing a lot of female flowers without enough male flowers. But it is a heavy producer and it's doing all right. Opposite that is my sweet pepper bed. And this is just a mix of different kinds of sweet peppers. I've got blot bell peppers and lesia peppers and corbachi peppers and they're starting to produce some fruit, but not everything is immediately recognizable. And I would have to look up my layout to know which one is which because the plants look very similar. But, um, I mean, I could tell you easily that this is a corbachi because it's got these long, thin peppers. And I could tell you that this one is a lesia because of the shape of the pepper. So the other peppers in here are kind of a mix of different kinds of bell peppers and I'm just gonna have to wait for them to color up to remember which one is which. All right, squeezing past the squash here at the base of the sunflowers, I have my palette strawberry planter. And then lastly, here in the main garden, this is an Okinawa pink okra that I planted in this barrel for Audrey because they're pink and it'll be a nice kind of centerpiece that will, uh, kind of catch the eye when it's got those bright pink okras on it. Hello, Shirley. May I help you? Hi, baby. 
So that's kind of everything in the main garden. Now we can move on to the container garden on the patio that's like right on the other side of the fence. Okay, so I came in here yesterday and cleaned up the tomatoes that were overhanging all this stuff. I did pull out the big giant four o'clock plant here, which is, I mean, they're flowers. And they were beautiful, but they were massive and they were covering up my little okra plant here. So I took them out. But what I've got here are, I have barrels that go all the way along the back. And that one actually does not currently have something. I'm planning on putting something in there. Uh, this one, I need to mulch it, but it, I think, I think that this is a roselle plant that's coming up because I seeded it a little while ago. And I'm hoping that's what that is. And then I've got the Costco totes here. They all have an okra plant in them. And those are, they're, the variety that I chose to go in these smaller containers is a jambalaya okra because it's supposed to be a little bit more compact. We'll see if that holds true, but I think one of them may be something else. I can't remember now what succeeded and what failed. So, always fun when you re sow things and it's like, oh, well, I know I sewed something different from my original plan. So, it'll be a surprise. Um, then this is a spearmint that I've had going in this little dollar store pot for two years now, and it's doing quite well. This barrel here, this is a Moringa tree. For anybody who has not heard of a Moringa tree, the Moringa is the most nutritious plant that has ever been tested in the world. It does grow worldwide. People have throughout history taken it with them and grown it for the nutritional value. And Every part of it is technically edible, um, though there's some debate about if the root of the tree is edible, but the, the fruit is edible, the leaves are edible, the seeds are edible. Um, they just had to be prepared in different ways, but it's super good for you. Tons of calcium and vitamin A and vi just everything. It has like everything in it. It's a superfood. And it is unique in that it is a tree that can be cut all the way down year after year and will keep coming back. So some, like the rule of thumb, I guess, is that most trees, if you cut it down once, it may come back a second time. But the Moringa tree will come back year after year after year. So in the winter, you just cut it down to a couple inches above the soil level and it comes back. And I've done that. This is its third year, I think, and they don't mind being trimmed like a shrub so they can stay manageable. If you let it go, it will grow into like a 30 to 60 foot tree. So I wouldn't keep that in a pot, but because it can be managed as a shrub, I keep it in a pot and that kind of helps control its growth so that it, may, it stays at a manageable size for me. And now moving on, let's see, I've got one bed that's like, it's all just volunteers that I let go because it was beautiful in the spring and now it's all kind of fading back. So I'll have to just find something that I want to put in this barrel. And then we have a volunteer sunflower that's getting very swoopy. So I might just pull that one out because that's terribly inconvenient. But under this sunflower, this is a Australian finger lime tree. It does have baby fruit on it. Let's see if I can find some. Hello, baby fruit. That one might not make it. But this tree spent a whole year, I think, in the little bucket from the store. Because I just never got around to it. Didn't have the money to like get another pot. And this spring, it was starting to really suffer. And I said, that's it. That's it, I'm transplanting it, and it immediately has exploded with growth. It's very happy. So I'm really excited to see some little baby finger limes. All right, if we just continue this way from the finger lime, this is a rose bush that's all tangled up in all of this. It needs to be probably moved. And then I have this long, skinny, in the ground bed that I have never really been super successful with, but it's got some noodle beans growing in there. So we'll see if those really take off. 
I think a large part of the problem is that there's just not enough sun over here. Like the morning sun is all swallowed up by the fence, but then the afternoon sun, a lot of these plants are kind of blocking it. But it is what it is, and I will continue to limp plants along in it as long as they'll grow. Uh, this is a volunteer four o'clock. Once you plant them, I swear you can't get rid of them. But they look glorious, and it's like the one thing that will do well in this in the in ground bed because they actually like shade. So I just leave them. Oh, you do not belong. This is a volunteer ground cherry. Another thing that once you have it, you can't get rid of it. We actually decided not to grow ground cherries this year because nobody will eat them and they take up quite a bit of space. So this is a Kogigu squash, which is a winter squash that I've grown once before and it's amazing. You can train it to grow vertically and the fruits on it are small enough that you don't have to worry about, um, about them like falling and breaking the plant. And it's a real, it's really good. And I mean, look at the variegation. These leaves are just beautiful. That's not disease. That is actual variegation. And it's, as the leaves mature, they will get more variegated. So like the newer ones don't have very much and the older ones do. But next to that, this is my pride and joy this year. This is a metal watering trough that we got uh, from our church when they no longer needed it for a baptism. And they uh i put hot peppers in here and they have just taken off because of the warmer soil temperature in here so they are just light years ahead of everything else they're covered in fruits i actually need to come in here and stake like all of these plants up because they're falling over they're so heavily laden it's so amazing in this bed i have a mix of shishito peppers and jalapeno peppers but i mean just get a load of how Full, these jalapeno pepper plants are they are just loaded I am so excited and then at the end here this is another barrel and this is another pepper plant that was puny when I left a couple weeks ago and it just took off and this is another hot pepper this is a lemon drop but as you can see it's like way behind all the other peppers because it doesn't have a single pepper on it yet it's finally starting to flower but there's no peppers yet and that's because the soil temperature stayed cool when we had a cool uh, cold snap come through so it's really interesting just how significant that soil temperature difference is between two planters that are in basically the same spot behind this lemon drop pepper this is actually volunteer um, malabar spinach and I was pulling them out when they were first coming up but it's like you know what I'm gonna just let them go so I won't let them get too crazy because I don't want them to choke out the plant, but why not guys? Because I have a hard time saying no to volunteers that want to live. This is a person who has a hard time thinning seedlings. So to see a volunteer that's like, I want to live. I'm like, oh, I want to let you live. So that's my gardening weakness is volunteers and thinning seedlings. That's why I will try and grow exactly how many plants I need because I don't want to thin them. Okay, so that's the backyard garden. I'm moving into the front, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip the crazy uh, beds along the side yard because honestly, those are just a mess and those are not intentional. And basically, it's nasturtium, the end. So, moving on. Now, this is exciting. So, Caleb decided to plant a mystery tomato. So, when we were at the seed expo, Brad Gates, the tomato guy, um, had seed packets available for a a new open pollinated variety of tomato but he had not stabilized it yet so he was saying that you know every seed is going to give you something a little bit a little different so caleb decided that he wanted to grow the surprise tomato all we knew was that it was something some sort of cherry tomato with anthocyanins in it and one of them is starting to color up now it shouldn't have green shoulders, I don't think, because anthocyanins means it should turn dark. So I don't think it's ready, but apparently it's going to be yellow. That's really cool. We'll just have to wait and see what happens when it's actually ripe. He's really excited about this. Then moving on into the next barrel here is Nathan's tomato. And look, he's got 
Oh, I just dropped it. I'm going to let him pick the rest of these, but look. Those are chocolate pear tomatoes. And Audrey wanted to grow flowers, so she's got, these are convolvulus flowers mixed in with some peppermint stick balsam. Let's see. The balsam is largely spent, looks like, but it still has a few flowers. Now in the fruit tree mound, I am struggling with some powdery mildew this year. I did come out and treat the tree uh, the other day with, I just made cheese yesterday, so I had plenty of whey and I just diluted that and sprayed the spots that I could reach. I mean, it looks like the disease reaches pretty high in the tree. There's nothing I can do about all the way up there, but I can treat stuff down here. But this tree is loaded with fruit. I've already come through and thinned it. So what ripens is what ripens. Good morning, Caleb. Good morning. How did you sleep? Yeah? You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. <laughs> I love you. So, these are yellow peaches and nectarines. Let's see, what else is on there? It's mostly peaches and nectarines this year because we hard proned the tree at the beginning of the year. Look at this interesting branch. It's like, whoop. But, um, let's see. I pruned off all of the white peach fruit this year because the, the graft itself is really small and I really wanted it to focus on growth. Look, a plum! There's not very many plums this year. Last year we were overrun with plums, but we had to hard prune and there's only a couple of plums on it this year. Speaking of plums, I just found this on the ground. Sad face. But you know what? I'm just going to cut off the bug eating part. We're going to freaking eat this plum because they're delicious. But another result of having to hard prune is that we only have, this is all the apricots for the whole year that we get off this tree. And it's already dropped one. Hang on, hang on until they ripen tree. Holy cow, I took a bite out of this plum from the ground and juice just sprayed everywhere. And it's so good, oh my gosh. Mm. Plums, I mean, was never a fan growing up, but those were the store-bought pressing ones that they pick before they're ripe and then they ripen on the shelf. It's just not the same as fruit that's ripened on the tree. It's so good. Uh, the apple tree is actually laden for the first time. It has always struggled, but this year we hard pruned the fruit salad tree to allow more light to it. And this tree here also got trimmed by the city tree service and it finally has gotten enough light to blossom and to fruit and it's also I think part of it is just it's mature enough now because two varieties had never even blossomed before this year. As a reminder this is a four in one apple tree so there's four different varieties of apple on here. Good morning Nathan. Morning. How'd you sleep? Long. Long. Uh -huh. So last night we went to a minor league baseball game. Till 10.30. It was late. Uh, his, his baseball team got to do, unfortunately because of COVID, usually every year they go out and walk out onto the field. But this year they just had them walk like- Around the park. Around the outside of it, which was a bummer. But still got to go and watch a minor league baseball game. And we were up really late. So we slept in late. Uh -huh. But hey dude. I picked you one of your chocolate pear tomatoes. There's more on the plant. What? There are. How is it? Yeah? Was it everything you hoped it would be? Except for the color. Except for the color? Because it's a chocolate pear tomato. Oh, you were expecting it to be more chocolate colored? Yeah. I think that was part of the original allure was that it looked like chocolate. Yeah. I mean, I told him, it's not going to taste like chocolate. I know. But I knew that it wasn't going to taste like chocolate. But he was like, it's going to be chocolate colored. It's not really chocolate colored. It's, it's technically a red tomato that has a brown blush on it. Uh, but it's still pretty good, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. And sweet. And yeah. sweet. You think it's sweet? Mm -hmm. I was just saying that it kind of has a little bit more zip and pop than yeah. the traditional yellow pear tomatoes. 
Yeah. So it's got a little bit more of that traditional tomato flavor. They're really good. All right, as we're moving on, everything back here is mostly inedibles. There are not inedibles, but they're ornamentals. Uh, the fenced area back there is kind of a semi-successful mushroom patch. The problem that we have is that we just get way too hot, way too fast. But these pots here in the front, mystery citrus trees. A friend of mine gave me these citrus trees. They were in Home Depot buckets. They were given to her by her neighbor. And unfortunately, those buckets had not had drainage holes drilled in them. So they were really struggling, really waterlogged. This one especially had like a cluster of leaves in one spot and it was like on its way out. And it took a little while for it to recover, but now it's happy. It's all filled out and it actually put out a little blossom a couple weeks ago and it was glorious and smelled amazing. It had a pretty big blossom, so I'm thinking that this must be an orange because she thought that at least one of them was an orange. So I'm thinking this one definitely is an orange. But the other tree, no idea. This one was the healthier of the two when we got it. Unfortunately, we do have a husband and children who live here who broke some of the tree off when they were out here uh, playing disc golf. And, um, but it's recovering now. I, this, is, this is brand new growth here just in the past couple of weeks. But this one has not flowered yet. So I don't have any indication of what kind of citrus it is. So we'll just have to wait and see. And then there's the kid's garden. Each kid has their own bed that they got to plant what they wanted to plant. Uh, Nathan is growing uh, yellow monster bell peppers in here. I need to come out here and probably feed them again. But this garden, the watering system is not as efficient as it needs to be. So we do struggle a little bit with that. Audrey has tomatoes. She's got, let's see, this one here that I can reach from this side of the fence. This one is a Cosmic Eclipse tomato. It's a really cool looking tomato. I don't think it's right. Ooh, hold on. Ooh, it popped right off. Audrey also has pink bumblebee tomatoes. She was very excited because they're pink. I'm gonna let her pick the rest of these, but I wanted to show you guys. That's the pink bumblebee. And she's also got a spider flower here because they will actually grow in the shade. It's a really unique looking plant. It's finally starting to blossom. It's not open yet, but it's gonna be purple. She'll be thrilled. And then there's Caleb's bed. So Caleb is planting, or growing, Paul Robeson tomatoes, which it only just started to set the fruit, so doesn't have anything ripe yet. He's also got a cucumber that's not doing very well. I checked on it yesterday and it was fine. I'll have to make sure that we closely monitor that. And then I also put some lemon thyme in here because it can do okay in partial shade. And in the afternoon, this gets shaded. But then we have a skinny strip here at the end. And this is a watermelon. It's a Cajo watermelon. It has a melon! That's exciting. The kids really like watermelon. So that is everything that we are growing like in our gardens. We do have an, another grapevine in the backyard. Um, but basically this is all, all the food that we grow here. Now we're not able to replace the grocery store, but we are able to augment our diet with some other things, with different varieties, with fresh food. It seriously makes a difference. That plum that I ate, oh my gosh, like you're not buying that from a grocery store or even I don't know that I've even found one at the farmer's market that was that good. Getting to eat something that ripens on the plant instead of on the shelf makes a significant difference. And even the nutritional value of the food is significantly higher when you are eating it fresh versus days or even weeks old from shipping. But this was my opportunity to show you guys just how much food we are able to produce on such a small amount of land slash space. Thanks for joining me on this more detailed tour of all the things that we're able to grow here on our little bit of space. It's amazing just how much you can cram into an area when you're really determined. <laughs> My goal here is just to encourage you guys to 
do what you can with the space you have. I mean, not everyone's gonna be able to throw a fruit tree in their front yard, but if you can, I mean, seriously, getting those grafted fruit varieties that are those grafted fruit trees that have multiple varieties on them, you are getting as much bang for your buck as you possibly can. Like, in the space that I have to grow two trees, I get four kinds of apples and five different kinds of stone fruits. So it's pretty awesome what you are able to do in a small amount of space. My hope is to encourage people to do what they can with the space they have. For now, I am living off of this, the joy of having what I have. And I hope that you're able to do the same. Thank you so much for joining me. As always, this is your urban nerd with a goat herd telling you you can grow where you're planted.